Sullivan, welcome to hey. WTFW. Good, good hey, to hear you. Man, good to be here. Good Thank to you. Hear, good to hear your voice, man. It's a. Uh, it was a uh, uh, quite a performance you gave a few weeks ago. Uh, that uh, Bernard Thompson uh, bringing you down to D.C. And, oh man, thank you. Uh, we had a chance to talk a little bit, and uh, and uh, my man Maurice Jackson gave you a book about D.C. jazz. I hope you had a chance yeah. to look at it <laughs> on, on your way home. And uh, you know, you dedicated the concert to uh, to the late Ellis Marcellus. It was on his birthday. Mm-hmm. And I was wondering if you could tell us about your, your your connection with him in New Orleans, and 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 that, basically how you got into this music. Um. Well, <laughs> um, do you want to hear the Ellis part first, or how I got into the music? Because that's two completely different stories. Okay. Well. Uh, well. Well. How you got into the music, and then the connection to Ellis. Okay. Um, well, I went to the New Orleans Center for Creative Arts. I started out playing in church. And um, when I was about 12 years old, there was this piano player that came to the church, and he was playing, like, all different styles of piano and organ. And I was like, man, how did you learn to play all of this stuff? And he said, you need to go to the New Orleans Center for Creative Arts and study music there. Mm -hmm. And I had never had a formal piano teacher before then. So I was like, okay, well, I'll audition. I'll audition on on a gospel song, and they let me in. And, um... That was kind of like my introduction to jazz. My piano teacher at the time was Peter Martin, you know, who plays with Diane Reed mm-hmm. and um, Christian McBride, and you know, um, he was my he was my first piano teacher. And then, um, then you know, other pe- other people started coming into the school. Uh, Clacker Jr., who was the who was the trumpet teacher, and he was the professor for people like Irvin Mayfield and and uh, Nicholas Payton, and a lot of jazz luminaries from New Orleans who are trumpet players and horn players, kind of Christian Scott, they all studied with him. Okay. Mm-hmm. Scott. And um, he actually gave me my first jazz recording that I fell in love with, and that was Errol Garner's Concert by the Sea. Uh-huh, that okay. Was like my sophomore, sophomore year in high school, and I was hooked ever since. Well, it was qu- quite an album to be your introduction. Oh yeah, yeah, most definitely. That was the that was the one. Mm-hmm. That was the one, and I've been playing it for a year. You know, I've spent my whole freshman year playing it and didn't like it at all. You know, because <laughs> I just didn't really feel like I could relate to it. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was music that was very foreign. No one in my family listened to jazz. No one in my family liked it. You know, <laughs> so I was kind of like the oddball playing all of these weird harmonies and, and, and stuff at church until I found Errol Garner, and he actually kind of made made sense of it in a way. And I could relate to him because, you know, it was something very natural and organic about his plan, just like me, you know, in a way. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and interesting, you know, he was so popular, you know, that I mean, more households had that concert by the sea or, you know, versions of Misty, you know, I mean, it was yeah. just incredible in terms of his, his, his popularity and a name that, that certainly should be remembered, you know, today. Absolutely. Most definitely. Most definitely. I mean, and there's like, you know, there's, there's kind of been a resurgence of piano players who have kind of come up with that type of awareness and that type of respect for people like Errol Garner, people like Fats Waller, people like uh, Earl Hines, mm-hmm. you know, people uh, like Teddy Wilson. There's, there's kind of like this new resurgence of piano players my age or younger who's just like really really drenching themselves in that in that literature. And it, it's pretty remarkable. I, I, I'm chuckling because I'm, I'm old enough to have seen Teddy Wilson and, and uh, Earl Father Hines perform. So, you know, mm-hmm. I, could, I could make that connection, uh, absolutely. To see, it, oh, it's yeah. really, really great to see younger musicians looking, looking backward, but taking it forward, you know. It, it's not just... Oh, yeah. uh, it's not just museum piece music. It's uh, also right. something that, that, that moves along. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a living organism, definitely. Yeah. So, uh, getting back to to Ellis Marcellus, how did you uh, meet him? What what was that connection there? Well, I met Ellis strangely enough. I was a I was in the seventh or eighth grade mm. 
applying to this gifted and talented. They had something in the New Orleans public school system where you could test the gifted in like different mm-hmm. um, areas. They didn't have that in every school system. You know, gifted in, in English, gifted in math, gifted, right. gifted in sciences. For me, it was gifted and talented in music. And there were, were, it was kind of like an audition process to have a teacher kind of come in and kind of like just kind of like just sit there and babysit sit you while you're playing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you're playing piano. And I met Ellis during that audition process. I didn't know who he was. I just thought he was just this mean old man. <laughs> it was awful. He was absolutely awful. I thought <laughs> I thought he was the meanest. He made me cry in my audition. Oh, Lord. You know, I it was, it, was, it sure. got that deep to me. I was like, I can't believe this man is vibing me out. I'm, I'm, I'm like ten or eleven years old at the time. I'm like, I don't know anything about music. I don't know how to read. I don't know what key I'm playing in, and he's making me feel really, really bad about it. Fast forward to maybe a few weeks after his passing, I called Winton, and I said. Man, um, I heard about your father. I'm so sorry to hear about that. He said, you know, my daddy loved you. <laughs> I was like, really? He said, I, really? I was like, I mean, I had run into him a few times after yeah, he would sure. look back at me and he would smile. Oh, good. But when yes. he told me, said he he called me right after your audition in the seventh grade. Wow. I was like, really? <laughs> he, made that, said, he made me cry on that audition. He said, man, he fell in love with you instantly. Mm-mm-mm. I was like, wow, you know, so you never, you never know, man, you never know, but he was oh, always yeah. kind of like one of those guys that was, especially when I got to NOCA and then I graduated and went to Oberlin, I would go back during summers and they'd maybe have like one or two lessons with him, you know, just to kind of, sure. mm-hmm. just to kind of pick up some wisdom and he always had something, I always left his, his house. <laughs> Dolores would answer the door. She'd be like, "What do you want?" <laughs> so I want to have a lesson with Ellis. Said, well, go out there and take a lesson. <laughs> wow. You know, and he was always strict. You know, really. You know, uh, absolutely. And I, I, I heard that 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 he was strict with 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 Winton. You know, with, with his sons. You know, he made them learn. You well, know, yeah, I, was, I, mean, I mean, he was he was he was the type of person that was really really blunt. If you were serious about something. If you if he saw that you were serious about music, he would be serious with you. Sure, and he would let you know that you know. I, I like people like that that just don't cut no corners and don't play nice to be nice. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. you know, just just be upfront and honest. You know, and you know, it, he's not he's never free to let you know his opinion. And that's one of the things I've always admired and respected about him. I think he was one of the best teachers that music that jazz had ever seen. Mm-hmm. You know. No, yeah, no, I and mean, Barry Harris, and, mm-hmm. and, and you know, just yeah, they're just they're just the great, great humans, great teachers, and uh, great nurturers. Absolutely, absolutely. So, who did you uh, study with at Oberlin? Who were, were some of the people you encountered there? Oh, um, the piano, the jazz piano professor there was a guy named Dan Wall, or is a guy named Dan Wall, I should say. Um, Dan, if you guys don't know who Dan is. He's kind of known more so on the organ side. He did a lot of stuff with John Abercrombie's trio. Mm-hmm. Um, used to play a lot with Eddie Gomez and, and Jeremy Steig. And, you know, a lot of stuff he'd recorded for Inja, which right. is kind of like, right. you know, that, 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 that situation that was, I guess, in Rivals at one point with ECM. I'm not sure if that's correct. But, um, yeah, he did a lot of stuff with them, and he was just a, he was a fantastic pianist. Just just mind blowing to me, you know. Um, and I learned so much from him. Um, and you know, I did classical lessons with a guy named Sanford Margolis. And, um, but the other jazz professors that was very interesting was uh, Gary Bart. Yeah, absolutely, I knew you'd mention Gary, my man. <laughs> was yeah, been there for years at Oberlin. Absolutely. Yeah, Gary Bard. Uh, Billy Hart, um, I think when I was there, the trumpet teacher was Marcus Belgrave. Yes, the late Marcus and Belgrave. Billy Hart just celebrated a birthday the other day. Uh, he's now he sure did. In blind. He I, sure. I kicked off today's show featuring his music, wishing him a happy birthday. Oh, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, D.C. native, too. Huh? Mm-hmm, absolutely. His mom lived right around, the, not too far from where I live right now. So we oh, wow. he'd come down and visit her and I'd catch up with him, you know. You know, so we've oh, known each other since the 70s. That's amazing. I'm telling on my age in a way. But uh, in any case, uh, what, what happened after you got out of Oberlin? How did you get your uh, career kicked started? Well, I um, went to uh, New York, and I, st- I went to Manhattan School of Music immediately uh-huh. to get my master's degree. I kind of My dad kind of made me promise that if I was going to go into music to at least get my master's degree so that I would be able to teach if, if, if playing didn't work out for me. Right. So I went to Manhattan School and... You know, and while I was doing, while I was studying, I was studying with Jason Moran at the time. Mm-hmm. And um, I studied with Jason Moran and Phil Markowitz. And Jason, after the first semester, recommended me to play with Stefan Harris's band. So that was kind of like my introduction to the New York tour life and gigging life. You know, sure. playing mm-hmm. b- between tour, going on tour with Stefan Harris. And later was Roy Hargrove after that second semester had ended. Between that and doing every Friday and Saturday night at Cleopatra's Needle at like midnight to three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> okay, right. Yeah, yeah. I did that for like about three years. Mm-mm-mm. So you uh, you worked with Roy Hargrove for a while, and he came back to work with you on a couple of cuts on on uh, Moments Preserved. How 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 was that working working with Roy? Um, I, I I guess I always tell people that I got my master's, I got my bachelor's from Oberlin, my master's degree from Manhattan School of Music, and my associate's degree from Roy Hart. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> <laughs> it was it was kind of like it was it was it was definitely. Seven years of just every night was a learning experience. And Roy was the type of person that would teach without saying words. Okay. He wasn't very mm-hmm. much on words. He would just play. And you you could tell how he was feeling. Sometimes he would be feeling like complete crap. You know, he would, you know, have to go through dialysis the day before. Oh, he yeah, the health he would just be I'm completely sure. swamped. Yeah, he would be completely right. swamped and drained. And some days he'd be too weak to play, so it would kind of be up to the rhythm section to help carry him. And when sure. when we were really carrying him right, it's like all of a sudden he 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 gained life, uh-huh. and he was able to, you know, he was able to play a little bit stronger. And I felt like if it was a good night for the rhythm section, Roy was, you know, Roy was. That's the night that Roy sounded his best when we were driving, you know. During that time period, absolutely, uh, a lot of people became familiar with you as uh, the accompanist with Cecile McLaurin Solvant. How, how was that connection made? Um, I met Cecile at <laughs> well, I met Cecile on the, in the in the street in Harlem. We were walking. I was I was actually on a date with another young lady and uh i was coming from a restaurant she was going uptown as we were going down and i walked into it i was like oh hi this is oh, yeah we go to school yeah this is cecile she just won the month competition uh-huh, by this time, right. blah, blah, blah. and mm-hmm. then i ran into her again at a jam session i just kind of ran into him in random places one time we'll be at barry harris's class another time we'll be at a jam session at dizzy's you know another time it would be i would, I would hang out with aaron deal at his house and Aaron and Cecile were, were roommates. So they, you know, so I would go and see, I would see if I saw Aaron, I, I would kind of stumble on Cecile. You know what I mean? Right. And one day, I guess I got the nerve after a friend of mine encouraged me to ask her to do a gig with me um, at Mesro. This was December of 2015. Uh-huh. It was one of those gigs that, like, I'll never forget, you know. We were both like we, you know, both really nervous. It was just, but like as soon as we played, it was like instant. It was like an instant connection that was there, and and we've been rocking it ever since. Absolutely, absolutely. And her her career, and I'm sure because you've been a part of it, has really taken off. You know, and really doing some some incredible things. 
to say the least. So, yeah, we having a we we having a lot of fun. Good. <laughs> we have a lot of. As a matter of fact, I just I just landed in New York um, right before I called you uh, from Monaco. We were in Monte Carlo. Uh, we played at the Monte Carlo Jazz Festival yesterday. Oh my goodness! Oh. Went off like a <laughs> nine or ten hour flight. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, I really, given those circumstances, I really appreciate your, your call tonight. We've been trying to hook this up for, for a while now with some, some glitches along the way, but it's been, yeah, it's been a great conversation. And, uh, what, what do you have coming up next? What, what are you up to now? Um, well, tomorrow night and Saturday night, I start, um, I'm playing at Birdland, uh, Jazz Club, the theater, mm-hmm. part of the Jazz Club with Peter Bernstein and, his quartet, and then um, I fly out on Sunday to do a couple of shows at in Houston at this place called the Camera Performing Arts Center, and then I fly up to Ann Arbor to finish off the week at uh, with some solo and some trio things. So these oh. next few weeks for me is going to be pretty interesting. Absolutely. One 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 last question is uh, the the period of the pandemic when everything was shut down. How did you survive through that? What did you do? Oh, uh, do you want the radio verse? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> well, I yeah. mean, I mean, I, I mean, of course, I practiced. Mm-hmm. And I, I did a, a, a bit of writing, not too too much, but I did a little. Bit. I did quite a bit of it. Um, but a lot of that time was spent if I wasn't in a studio recording or like doing like those in home concerts with Cecile. Sure. Okay. Um, I was at home washing clothes and ironing and cooking mm-hmm. and, you know, kind of, Cecile kind of turned me into like this domesticated <laughs> okay. person. <laughs> okay. <laughs> wow. You know? Well, yeah. well, things have opened up, and, and you're keeping quite busy. And, and uh, uh, you know, I, I really want to thank Burnett Thompson for, for bringing you to Washington, D.C., that, that solo performance that, that you did uh, a few weeks ago. It was just so entertaining. And, and the audience, it was, a, you know, sold-out performance. And folks really, really got, got turned on to your music that night. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you yeah. for coming and making oh. it out. Oh, I had to, man, and, and I'm so glad that uh, that that Maurice Jackson gave you that book about jazz here in D.C. Uh, the the, gen- oh, yeah. the gentleman on the cover is John Malachi, and oh yeah, you know, and it, it, you know, absolutely, you know, and 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 again, really, you know, taught people how how you accompany vocalists. It, that was one of oh, the yeah. workshops that he used to do. That uh, you may not have taken lessons from him, but you certainly learned that so well with with Cecile. And we oh. we, we, we're going to hear some of the, the duet recording uh, uh, the, that that you did with her, uh, 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 the window. That, oh, uh, thank but uh, before I, I do that, I, I got queued up the, the piece that. Uh, you did of uh, the Elmo Hope composition, I So Beautiful as Years, because it, it yeah. features Roy Hargrove with you, and uh, it, mm-hmm. it's really, really a, a beautiful piece. Tell us about yes, the other, other other musicians working with you on that. Well, um, the bass player, I mean Celine, who's a D.C. native, um, was in Roy Hargrove's band with sure. me mm-hmm. during that entire time that I was with him and then up until, you know, Roy's passing, I think I mean was the bass player. And um Jeremy Clemens, who um I met just basically playing gigs in New York at like Fat Cat, Smalls and all of you know, he did some things with Roy also, but him and I mean are like yin and yang. They're right. like best friends okay. and they've been playing together since college, you know, so it was a good connection to have them as the rhythm section along with Roy. It felt it felt good. Well, it's a beautiful piece. I so beautiful as yours, and and again remembering the, the music of another great pianist, Elmo Hope, that uh, certainly oh, yeah. should be recognized. So I really want to thank you for calling in tonight, particularly after flying in. You know, it's it's it's. Quite an exciting but busy life that you have, and, and to take time oh, to, yeah. to call us up tonight has, has been a real honor for me. Thanks again. Oh, man, thank you. Thank you for having me, man.
And we I really appreciate it and support in the music. Absolutely. And we look forward to for you coming back to DC sometime in, in the near future. And, uh, I hope so. Yeah, we'll I work. So. We'll work it out. 